All right, so just like everybody else, when I first got into this hobby, I was really clueless as to what all the settings actually did. Uh, there was a lot of guessing and a lot of getting it wrong, and I'm sure it's something we can all relate to. Uh, and before I get in this video, please subscribe and hit the like button. Post your comments down below. I really appreciate it. It really helps the YouTube algorithm. Now, so these are 16 settings that are really good to know. Uh, no particular reason why it's the number 16. It just, that's how many I came up with that I could think of that were handy. Um, and, and once you know of these settings, uh, it can be easier to get the sound that you're looking for. And so just, just knowing of them can really help. Uh, and I'll put some bonuses down at the end too that I didn't think really deserved their own number on the list, but are still handy to know nonetheless. Now this is pretty Denon and Marantz heavy, uh, but it also applies to other AVR brands as well. Uh, it's just, that's a format I'm really familiar with and I really enjoy, so. Uh, but again, this does translate to other brands. Um, but yeah, number 16 is the audio delay or lip sync setting. Uh, and this is one where you may be aware of it, but you may not be aware of how to adjust it right. I know that was a problem for me. Uh, and so I use the Eagles concerts. Uh, those are great for syncing up the, the audio. Uh, and, and it is input specific. So for example, my Blu-ray is 126 millisecond delay, whereas my Fire TV is 164 millisecond delay. Uh, but the big thing that's handy to know about this is that adjusting by 10 milliseconds uh, instead of one millisecond will save you time and sanity. Uh, I, I never really got this right for a long time because I was always trying to adjust it by one millisecond, never noticing any difference, and I would just get frustrated and stop. It wasn't until I tried adjusting through my Blu-ray player and it only adjusted in 10 millisecond increments, I was like, oh, <laughs> I needed to be way up above, you know, like 120. And so knowing that you should adjust by 10 millisecond increments and then kind of zero in on it when you get close, that alone can save you a lot of time. Uh, number 15 is HDMI control. This just allows your devices to communicate, turn the whole system on, whole system off, turn up your amplifier by using your TV remote, all that stuff. It gets things communicating, uh, and that's something you'd have to adjust on your uh, AVR as well as your TV, uh, potentially, depending on what's already enabled as default and what isn't. So it's just something that can be a really convenient feature to enable, or if you don't want it, to disable. Um, so just knowing that the HDMI control is there uh, can be handy. Uh, number 14 is subwoofer level adjust. Uh, and for a lot of AVRs, you have to actually enable this feature. Uh, some just have it uh, on as, as default, but, uh, but for me, I turn it on. And also, uh, you can check out my gain hack video. I, I kind of game the gain structure a little bit uh, to get the most dynamics out of subs. And so, you know, the gain hack kind of goes into that. Um, essentially, I run negative 11.5 out of negative 12 uh, on Denon and Marantz products. And then I adjust and I compensate uh, by turning the subwoofer gain up. And so for some subs, this is like really obvious. It makes a huge difference. Um, for other subs, it doesn't do much. Uh, it just really depends on the particular sub, but I always do it as a habit uh, to ensure that I'm getting the most dynamics possible out of any subwoofer I listen to. Um, and the other thing that is that um, the deep bass subs that I recommend, they need more bass, they need more gain. Uh, because they have a flat frequency response, you can turn them up more before they become overdone, before they sound overdone. You know, you get that boominess that any sub, you can get that out of any sub. You turn it up too much and it's just, it's too much, it's too overdone. The trick is with the subs I recommend, the subs that are on the list, um, those are, are flat response, they're deep bass, so you're gonna get by with a lot more gain and get a lot more bass before it ever sounds overdone. So that's something that's really handy to know with the subs that I talk about. Running more gain on deep bass subwoofers really does make a difference. And you can check out my video on adjusting subs by ear. Um, that really does help. You can kind of get a better idea of how to get the most bass out of your system without it sounding like it's overdone. Number 13, uh, setup lock. And this is both on AVRs and subwoofers. Uh, and this allows, you know, or, or avoids unwanted changes. And so if you've got a teenager who thinks uh, he wants to change your settings and things like that, you can do the setup lock and disable that so that 
you know, going through the room correction is a pain. I do it a lot. I, because of the channel, I'm always, you know, going through room correction uh, to, to get the subs all adjusted and things like that. It's a process I know very well. It's, it's, it's at least an hour of my time to go through and set up uh, everything. So to, to have someone go in and maybe change that, I could see being very frustrating. Um, so, you know, and, and besides that, uh, you know, subwoofers like the PB4000 and PB16 Ultra, they have a, a front panel display. And so if you've got a toddler and they go up and they start pushing buttons and you don't even realize it and you get surprised or, you know, all of your settings are way off now, uh, you can go into the SVS app and, and disable that so you can lock that out so you can't use the front panel um, that i think is real handy uh, particularly with people with kids number 12 this is a big one uh, volume limiter uh, this prevents potential damage and complaints when you're not around so i have mine set at negative 10 just as a that's generally where i keep it i don't usually listen over negative 10 um, but there are some times where the audio for the for something i'm watching is not very good so i'll go in and disable that make it to zero or disable it completely so i can actually hear what i'm trying to watch but generally negative 10 works for me um, a lot of people love listening at reference level i'm not saying you shouldn't but having that volume limiter on uh, doesn't just prevent you know kids from from cranking it up when you're not home things like that it's also something where if like, you accidentally sit on your remote or something and crank it way up and I mean, it can avoid potential damage. And so that's why I like the volume limiter. It also allows me to be able to hand the remote to somebody and not worry that they're going to crank the system way too much and, you know, possibly damage things. And so that's why I like the volume limiter. Uh, dialogue features, uh, number 11. So, you know, dialogue enhancer, uh, it, it varies. Some are just channel level adjusts for the center channel. Others are EQ based. Some can be good, some are downright terrible. Uh, you can decide for yourself. Um, and, and I would generally leave it off for music, but again, if you like it, go for it. Uh, there's, there's no hard rules here. Uh, but it's one of those things where you know it exists, so you, if you're having a hard time watching a particular movie and the dialogue is really weak, then you can maybe try that dialogue enhance or just turn up your center channel. You know, it happens. Sometimes movies aren't mixed that well. But the other thing to know is that, uh, and this goes into another point later on on the list, is that there are settings in your Blu-ray player that doesn't allow lossless audio, and that can really affect how clear the, the dialogue is. And so that's another thing, but I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but another thing to look into is my center channel knock test. Uh, that's a hack that I have in my base hack series. Uh, a lot of times what you have your center channel sitting on can make it really noisy or really deteriorate the sound. And so just by adding a little isolation under there can really help whatever center channel you're running. It can make it sound a lot cleaner and therefore your dialogue can sound a little bit better. Number 10 is dynamic EQ. Uh, this allows for more bass at lower listening levels. And so when you're listening at quieter levels, the bass is still there. You don't have to crank it up just to hear your bass. Uh, it's, it's a bit of a, uh, it adds a little bit more bass the more you turn it down, but it's great. You can listen at a real low background level and still hear your subs and still hear that deep bass. And it's just, it's delightful. I don't like running it off. A lot of people hate dynamic EQ. Uh, it's a personal taste thing, but just knowing it's there uh, it can really help you. All right, number nine uh, is your movie and music buttons on your uh, AVR remote. Now, this can change your audio format, and it's important to know that a lot of these audio formats are weak, uh, such as you know all channel all channel stereo, uh, you know concert mode, hall mode. These all just sound terrible, <laughs> but it does serve a useful function in that you can change it from. Uh, an Atmos decoding to, or I'm sorry, a, a Dolby decoding to a DTS decoding or an RO3D recording, whatever you want to try. You can, you can experiment with it. That's the whole idea behind this, is that you know you can go through and change it uh, and change your audio formats and see what you like the most. It's all about experimentation and trying new things. Number eight is speaker levels. Uh, now, this is really useful for non-equidistant speakers. So most rooms are not going to have it to where you can have each speaker be exactly the same distance from the main listening position. 
Um, most of the time, you've got some uh, discrepancy there, some sort of difference in distance. And where that comes into play is when those distances are pretty extreme. Uh, a great example of that is in the RV project. I've got uh, the center or the rear channel uh, right behind my head. It's a terrible location for a speaker. I'm not gonna lie, it's awful. But uh, it helped me understand that you know, if you've got a speaker that's way far away and a speaker that's really close, if you set those to the same levels using a decibel meter, the one that's closer is going to sound way overdone and you're not going to be able to hear the one that's way far away. Even though you're doing it by the book, by the rules, and you're ooh, steadfast on the rules and you will not change that. Okay, that's fine. But for the rest of you, <laughs> if you've got speakers that are closer, you run those even lower than your Odyssey or your room correction would set it at. And the speakers that are much further away, you can run a little bit more and it'll sound more balanced. And you can check out my speaker level hack for more on that, but it really does make a difference. It can take something that should make sense but sounds awful into it doesn't make sense on the settings, but it sounds perfect. <laughs> so that's what I discovered. That's why I did the speaker level hack video because you know, that speaker being right next to my head, I, I all I could hear was that and I couldn't hear my front stage at all. Like it, it was just off. So I turned that way down by like eight or nine dB. And then I actually boosted my front stage a little bit. And now everything sounds balanced, even though on a dB meter, there's a huge discrepancy on the levels. I don't care if I had them all matched, it would sound terrible by changing those based on how far away they are. It really brought everything into balance and, and allowed me to do that. So again, check, check out that video for more on that. Number seven is Odyssey Flat versus Odyssey Reference. Now, there's a lot of people that are going to be staunch on one opinion or another as it is as it goes in audio. But me personally, I like flat. Other people really love reference. Some people don't like it at all. They have just go with what you want to go with. But just know that it is uh, source dependent. Uh, default for Denon and Marantz's uh, reference. So frustratingly, every time I go through room correction, I have to go through each source and reset it as flat. And sometimes I'll be listening, I'll be like, man, this just doesn't sound good. And I'll, oh, it's on reference. I'll change it to flat. The world is right again. So just know that uh, every time you go through room correction, you're going to have to readjust it for every single source. It's frustrating, but it's something I'm well familiar with. Okay, number six is huge. Um, number six is Blu-ray, BD audio mix, or secondary audio, bitstream settings, all that's good stuff, right? Uh, most Blu-ray players, <laughs> frustratingly, come default in such a way that the best sound formats cannot be transmitted to the AVR. Why? I, I don't know. Write your congressman. I don't, I don't know. I don't care. But it's important to know this. It's like a secret handshake. And if you don't have the secondary audio mix off, and if you don't have it set to bitstream instead of PCM, you're not going to get your DTSX, your IMAX, your Atmos, your True HD, DTS Master. It goes on. Basically, your lossless, uncompressed formats are bottlenecked until you change the setting. And you can see my video on unlock your Blu-ray player, but this one is super important. If you haven't done this and you do it, you will notice a difference. It's dramatic. Uh, going from compressed audio to lossless audio, wow. I mean, when I first did it, I was like, this is amazing. Um, so yeah, number six is super important. Uh, number five, uh, your Blu-ray audio and display buttons on the remote. Uh, this allows you to see and change the audio formats and bit rates. So it allows you to see how much information is coming across for both your video and your audio. Uh, and you can tell, like if you go from a basic simple audio format to an uncompressed format, you'll notice that it's a much higher bit rate, um, a much more information coming through. It's lossless, it's uncompressed. And so where this is important is for, you know, things like Eagle's Farewell One Tour and Ready Player One. In both of those Blu-rays, the default sound is not the best. Uh, so, for example, Eagle's Farewell 1, the default is two-channel. So, if you go in and you change that default to DTS Master, wow. Uh, if you have a surround system, it really comes to life. If you're just running two-channel, it doesn't matter. But, 
when you're running surround, that Blu-ray really comes to life. It's the best concert I've ever heard on Blu-ray. It's phenomenal. Um, like I said, I use it in several other... It's, it's a very good Blu-ray, so if you don't have it, it's worth picking up. But also Ready Player One. Dolby Atmos is not the default format. So, you know, you can go back and hear that movie for the first time in Atmos if you haven't done this. So that's why the Blu-ray audio and display buttons are important on your Blu-ray remote. Number four, uh, this may seem a little rudimentary, but uh, the crossover on your AVR. Uh, now, you know, you can see my large versus small article uh, for a more in-depth explanation on this. Um, and a lot of people that watch my channel are be like, dude, come on, crossover. Um, but honestly, there's a lot of people that never touch it. And uh, there's a lot of people that run their own correction and never adjust it. And they, they just let it be determined and leave it the way it is. Don't touch it. You're not allowed. You're breaking the rules. Um, yeah, you know, go in and, and adjust your crossover settings. Um, the reason for that, uh, you can see my crossover hack video for that. Um, but the lower the crossover setting is on your AVR, the smaller the operating window for your subwoofer. So if you have your crossover setting at 40 hertz, okay, you can only hear down to about 20 hertz. After that, it's infrasonic. You can't hear it, right? But so if you've got a subwoofer that's only allowed to operate from 20 hertz to 40 hertz, it's only got a 20 hertz operating window. Now, if you change that to 90 hertz, you've just expanded the operating window from 20 to 70 effective audible you know, operating range. It makes a huge difference. Um, so it, it's very worth doing. So I mean, I'm sorry, it may be weird that I have that, that high up on the list, but it makes a huge difference. If you haven't changed your crossovers and you haven't turned your crossovers up a little bit, you're not really hearing, and it also makes it harder to integrate your subs. Um, if you've got your crossover set at 40, good luck uh, integrating that by ear it's going to be really difficult because it's going to be the lowest frequencies, which are a little bit harder to hear than the upper bass frequencies. So it's just a lot of havoc. So it's worth checking out. All right, number three. Uh, this is another huge one. Uh, subwoofer distance setting. So alterating the subwoofer distance setting can improve the response and it can be more precise than just using a phase switch alone. Uh, and you can also see my distance hack on that. Uh, and, and so... It, what it does, what I do is I, I add four feet to the distance of the subwoofer after room correction sets it. So these subs may come in at 12 feet, right? I'll make it 16 feet. And what that effectively does is it populates the room with bass a little bit sooner uh, than everything else. And bass decays slower in a room than mids and highs. And so to me, it just makes more sense to populate it before everything else versus going the other direction and taking, you know, four feet of distance off. Now, it might be one foot, it might be two foot, three foot, four foot, five foot. I wouldn't go beyond five foot because then you, you get a weird sensation. Um, but really, the best way I could describe it to someone who's never done it is it kind of adds soul to the bass. That's not really what it does. It, it reduces cancellations and allows you to hear more of it. But... I, that's the best way I could describe it. Is it, it? It's like you're hearing more of the soul of the bass, and it really just it changes the whole thing. Um, I had an issue with this trying to adjust everything at CES last year in the RV. Drove me nuts, and I forgot about my own hack. <laughs> I finally did it. I'm like, oh, bingo. There we are. Uh, now it sounds right. So, you know, it, it does make a huge difference, um, and so the distance uh, setting is super important. Number two, speaker configuration, small versus large. Again, a lot of people are going to be shaking their heads, but you basically have a bass managed speaker or non bass managed. So as small, it takes the signal that would normally all go to your speaker and directs some of that to the subwoofer, depending on the crossover you're set. So if you have it set to large, none of the signal going to that speaker will go to your subwoofer. And so you'll be missing bass. You can use LFE plus main, but uh, I did my hack video on that, um, whether you should set it as large as small, LFE plus main. For me, personally, uh, using the hack that I did in that video, uh, using a particular track to judge it, the, the subs just do a better job of it. So these are large speakers. They're capable of going down to 20 hertz, but I set them as small, crossed over at 90 hertz. Now, if I turn off the subs, 
you'll still hear signal all the way down to 20 hertz through the towers, even though the crossover is at 90. It's just a soft cutoff. It's not a hard cutoff like it is for the subs. So it's, you're not losing the effectiveness of a, of a tower by setting it to small. These towers still add a lot to the whole base experience in this room, even though I have them set to small. They're still active below the crossover. That's important to understand. A lot of people don't understand that, and they're like, I feel like I'm losing my money if I set them at small. It's just not the case. It's worth checking out and trying it out yourself. You can see that video uh, on the large versus small hack. You can try it yourself and see for yourself which sounds better. And it will depend on your speakers. It'll depend on your subs. But it's worth exploring. Um, number one, this is the most important one. Most important setting I think you could do. Uh, it, it can prevent damage. It can prevent a really, really sad situation. Someone, one of my viewers relayed a story to me that just, oh, it's heartbreaking. Um, he was listening to his uh, system and he had four very expensive subwoofers. And, you know, it, it, he had a great system, a great setup. And what had happened was his teenager, I think, went in and cranked the system up and then turned the system off. Okay. When he turned it back on, boom, all four subs destroyed, uh, just blew the amps. And it was several thousand dollars worth of damage in an instant, gone. And so number one is volume on startup, okay? This prevents damage like that from ever happening. Uh, you know, you, you, for me, I set it at negative 45. It's just super cheap insurance because even if you've got, say you're listening at reference level and you accidentally turn it off, what do you do? I mean, yeah, you can unplug your subs. You can maybe unplug the AVR. Hopefully it comes back on. Maybe unplug all your speakers to make sure they don't pop. Why not just change that setting? It's a simple setting, just go in and adjust it. And just, it's cheap insurance. It's absolutely worth doing. So those are my top 16. Uh, my bonuses are uh, the info button on your, on your AVR. It allows you to see which formats you're actually getting. Also, it shows you which speakers are active. So if you're listening to an Atmos movie and you realize that not all of your speakers are active, you may be like, what's going on here? And what I found is that some speaker configurations in the amp assigned setup of the menu do not allow Atmos to go through to those speakers. Weird. I would have only caught that by knowing about the info button and seeing that I wasn't get, getting those uh, speakers being active. So that can make, make a huge difference and really change the way everything goes for you. Uh, volume scale, I set mine from negative 79.5 to positive 18. Um, basically reference versus the zero to 98, not a big deal. Um, dynamic volume, I don't really like it. I leave that off. Uh, eco mode, I leave that off. Uh, of course, all this stuff is up to you. Uh, but uh, the last one is restore um, on low. It adds bass to the content you're listening to. Uh, it's meant for, you know, uh, it's got a different purpose, but it does add to the bass and it's really a matter of taste, but it's something you can experiment with. Um, but those are the settings that I think can really help you get the most out of your system. Uh, you can explore them in depth through the videos that I've mentioned, uh, and I'll link them down in the description below. Um, as always, thank you so much for watching. This was a long video, but I thought it might be worth it for a lot of people that are maybe new into the hobby, or maybe you've been around for a long time and didn't realize some of these settings existed. Um, so I just want to put it together. If you have any other settings that you think are a really good idea, or something I missed, or you disagree with the settings I use, Put it down in the comments below. I want to hear your feedback. I want to know what my audience is thinking. So uh, once again, thanks so much for watching and please subscribe.